for, um, for the features I add on. It's, I had, unfortunately, a slide in my older presentation where it's visualized, but uh, let's say I have a feature that is user likes Facebook, no, user likes sci-fi books. Mm -hmm. Then in, on the row for that user, there will be a number for how much that user likes sci-fi in the column that is encoding my sci-fi, uh, how much I like sci-fi. It's very hard to, to explain. Yeah, but <laughs> no, it, it is. It's just adding columns. Where ev every new column is this new feature I add. Mm -hmm. and it could be a user feature, which is basically if I like sci-fi, or it could be an item feature, which is basically if this item is that would be a row, a row yeah. where where you have uh, yeah. If if this is a sci-fi book, mm -hmm. so it's still a matrix. It's just expanding it. Mm -hmm. But actually, how that actually looks like, it's hidden behind the API of this package. So that's why they have, he has some special packages for, for, for creating that. So I, I'm not 100% sure as I could be wrong, but I, this is, I think in the factorization machine paper, it actually has a good visualization of how that matrix will look like, this 2010 paper. Oh. Okie doke. Uh, so I create my interactions matrix is just this click my history matrix and then I create an item matrix with my uh, item features, a user matrix with my user features and since I have a sparse representation in the sparse representation in Python I only get subset of the data is actually in the matrix there so I can say that even though I have a lot of item combinations the non-trivial interactions is a big subset of that. So now we get into the training. So as you noticed, uh, in the classical Netflix problem, you have the ratings of the movies. I like this movie five, I don't like this movie, so I put one and so on. So what, um, and that's called explicit feedback, because I actually tell the system in some way if I like something or not. So what they realized was that actually explicit, implicit, explicit feedback is bad, because Usually, users only rate stuff they uh, like, so you have a bias towards liking. And, and also, you put your ratings a on a lot of what your fri friends think you're liking. So, I mean, I'm a cool movie goer, and I only like black and white French movies, because that's what I think my friends think is cool. So, there's a bias in explicit feedback. So, what uh, people usually do nowadays is to use only implicit feedback. And that's basic, implicit feedback is only my interactions, actually what items I have interacted with, not what I think about it or what I tell my friends I, I like. But if I only have implicit feedback, it's harder to, to train a model. It's not obvious that, because I only have interactions with items and then I have zeros for the rest. And that's, if I try to optimize the probability of choosing something, the zeros doesn't actually mean that I don't like it could just mean that I haven't seen it yet. Or that I, I mean, I, have, I haven't watched Star Wars 2, so I will not have seen Star Wars 3 either. Um, so what people start doing then is to take something called a ranking loss, where they compare items. Do you think I like this item more than that item? And then you try to learn the model of putting the conditional probability or some number to be higher for the item I have interacted with compared to the item I haven't interacted with. Uh, and there's a lot of ways of doing that. Um, and sort of approach in the package, they have different ways here. But what approach that worked nicely is something, a weighted approximate rank pairwise thing that when, because if I want to train on all the different pairs in my data set, it becomes a huge amount of data. So I want to sample pairs. I sample items first. The item I sample is something I have chosen, and then I sample from all the items I haven't chosen, and I create a pair from that. Um, but this 
if I don't want to spend all my life training, I have to choose a subset. And I can resample every, after every epoch, for example. I can resample my pairs and I can rank them on how good the model is actually on predicting the item I have chosen instead of the item I haven't chosen. Uh, to make it harder and harder for the model to train as the epochs go by. Um, and this is of it's negative sampling. I think it's used in um, more scenarios than this one. Uh, but that's basically the idea, idea. So that as the epochs go by, you sample up items that are uh, harder, you sample pairs that are harder to predict and to, to increase uh, the model's ability to learn. But actually one need, doesn't need to know the details. I can just put loss equals to warp here and, and the model will train. Um, so this is basically, now I have created my data set um, using the data set creation functions in the package. Um, Quick question, what's an epoch here? Epoch is going through the data set once. The whole? The whole data set. The whole matrix? Yep. Yeah. And doing stochastic gradient descent on, on that. But isn't that huge? You have all authors times all, uh, all words essentially. Yes, but it's a sparse representation. Uh -huh, okay, you only go through the positive. Yeah. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, and that's why I have to do this pair sampling. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so do you use, uh, sample one negative for each positive? Yes. Right. And, and, then I, and then I resample that after every epoch. So I sample pairs that are hard to predict and let the model train on the next epoch on those harder to predict pairs. So because, okay, the, the basic reason is that if I just sample a negative item randomly, I will get items that are very unpopular if I have a big space of items and most of them are easy to classify as not popular at all. I mean, no one reads, I don't know, some other. And even though I can, I would spend a lot of CPU cycles on just chaining on trivial pairs. Yep. And I put my latent space to be 10 dimensional. Um, I didn't do some hyperparameter search here, I just put some nice number, and then I have some uh, regularization of the embeddings, because my embeddings become weights, um, and I can put regularization on those weights, of course, otherwise they can grow uh, too big, and my model will overfit, of course. Uh, I train for 30 epochs, and here they are, um, and I can validate. And uh, I validate the, the model by looking at authors and tokens come, yes. All right, so, so mm -hmm. you talk about positive and negative uh, samples. Uh, and when you're, uh, what you had in the data was the counts, right? And is it the case that everything that's about series is about positive sample? Yes, right. Yeah, I actually skipped that part, sorry. So yeah, I only take an interaction, even though how many times you have interacted with an item, I only take it as one. Yeah, that's. Well, I would not scroll too much in the code because that's only confusing. I think in the classical paper, the number becomes a conditional from those of you liking for a zero one, because uh, like, this item or not. Mm -hmm. Same here. I'm not sure I thought. Uh, the number that how many times you interacted with the item becomes a conditional uh, feature of. Uh, No, but that's, I don't think that, well, I haven't seen people doing that, no. No, because it's, um, I don't, yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think actually it will improve the model of you doing that. Because it's basically, you want to learn someone has interacted with an item. There's probably not much extra information with you interacting a lot with it, but I'm, I'm uh, unsure, I'm unsure, uh, and I didn't try it, I just said ones and zeros, because, yeah. I think in classical, uh, like the first paper that was... Uh, On implicit feedback? On implicit feedback. Ah, okay. Mm. They consider the number as a condition, mm. so they take a, mm. it, it, it basically looks like a uh, zero, one uh, interaction, but mm. the, the number of how many times you uh -huh, interacted okay. becomes a probability of you 
is one. Or and one. how do you how do you normalize the probability in terms of the space of all the different items that you have chosen? Yeah. You know that. Nice. Cool. Uh, what was which uh, loss? It was the loss here. The way uh, okay, the ranking something magic. <laughs> the ranking something magic. Yeah, I don't remember. Actually, shit, I forgot to incre in include the formula here. But in ranking loss, you take the probability of you choosing the, the positive pair minus the probability of you choosing the negative chair, and you normalize that so that you get a negative number if you like the. You could, I think they actually do it with a sigmoid so that you get. A uh, very low, a high loss if the, the negative number is, is, uh, has a higher ranking than the positive item. So that's right. Does it make sense? Yeah. 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 So that's the loss here. Yeah, sorry, I didn't include it in the, my notebook. Uh, just the shape. So for each uh, sample in the data set, you just sample random uh, data as a negative sample? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The first epoch. Afterwards, I will have this negative sampling, where actually every negative item I sample, I will rank it and see that if this is already r um, ranked much lower than the positive item I have chosen, I will throw it away and sample a new item until I have a data set of pairs that are hard, to, hard for the model to rank correctly. But can't you then select randomly pairs that are real, like close to reality? And then what do you mean, real? Like, if you randomly sample an author and an item mm -hmm. that reflects reality, like it's not, it's random, but it's coincidentally real. Like, uh, it has high probability. I, I, sorry, you lost me. So, uh, I'm not sure if I understand this correctly, but if you sample, like, um, an author and an item, mm -hmm. but that item does. No, I, 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 I sample an interaction, which is a user item pair. Okay. Oh, okay. That's my positive sample. And then for the negative sample, I will sample something that it hasn't chosen. Yeah, but I was talking about the negative. Mm -hmm. but okay, and then I rank that one according to my model I have. And if it's already ranked below the positive item I have sampled, I throw that combination away and I th throw in a new negative sample until I have something that is ranked very similar to my positive item. It's very similar to the area under curve calculation. When you calculate everything that's uh, negative, probability of positive being higher than negative. Maybe? <laughs> I mean, I'm usually, I'm used to thinking of the AUC curve as just this precision and call curve you draw, yeah, but I know that you can interpret the area yeah. underwards as a probability. Yeah. Oh, it's very similar. And mm. Yeah, I think that the, the case that he's raising is the chance of, by chance, uh, in your negative sample, combine a positive one or something. Okay, but I already condition on not doing that. Yeah. Yeah. If the space is big enough, the chance I mean, it's negative also. Okay. Let's validate this model uh, by looking at the interactions I had after March and see how well does my model actually predict the items that someone has chosen in that period. Um, and there is, it's easy to, easy to cheat here, and it's very hard to, to um, validate super proper. Um, so let's look at some different cases. Um, but okay, so in, in scroll it up here, but I create, let's go into the details here. I do, uh, I look at three metrics, precision at k, recall at k, and area under the curve. So precision is k, is basically I let the, the algorithm pick for each user the k most highest ranked items, and I looked at, look at, of these k items, what uh, did the author actually write about those topics in my validation period? And I get the number of fractions. I can also look at recall at k, that is, in my top items that I have picked, how many of those were actually in my whole set of items I, I um, have written about in this 
in this period. It's sort of the recommender analog of these. Um, but here you don't take the order into account. No. no. I mean, I, I, there are actually what, it's actually bad metrics. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you need to put the level somehow here. But so the the good way of doing this is probably normalized discounted cumulative gains. There is a good metric uh, still coming back to that original paper from the feedback, but okay. they take a percentile of which part, basically they take say 100 first items, then they take uh, if it's in the beginning, uh, it's a zero percent close. Mm -hmm. If it's far away, it's 100 percent close. And then they look at the predictions and they have a nice formula which basically shows you a number between 0 and 100 and 100 is uh, the worst and 1 is 0 is the best. What's the name of that metric? Yeah. Does it have a name? I don't remember. Um, I don't remember. Because there is, it's not normalized, right. discounted, no. cumulative gain. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. it's something else. But it's, very, it's similar, uh -huh. but it's Wait. not that one. Yeah. Because there are a lot of different variations of that metric where you rank in different orders and yeah, you normalize yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, but just to keep the level of this recommend, uh, this meetup um, easier to comprehend, I chose these metrics just because they're easy mm -hmm. to understand. And then you have the area of the, under the curve. Um, which is at the curve of this, these two metrics. Um, and here I have quoted this, the probability that a randomly chosen positive example has a higher score than a randomly chosen negative example. But I haven't really figured, I don't know why that's the case. <laughs> I didn't see a derivation of that. Um, and let's look at the metrics. These are numbers. I got some numbers. Um, it's very hard to interpret if this is good or bad. Uh, Precision at K, we call it KR 14%, which sounds low, but depends completely on the structure of your data if that's good or bad or not. Depends on the K also. It depends on the K, of course. But what, is, what is the K? K that's here 10. is 10. Okay. Sorry. Uh, K is 10. Yeah. It's a default value. Um, but the area under the curve is really, really high. If you do a normal classification task, this would be a super good model. But the reason for why AUC is so high for recommenders is basically they have so many crappy items that no one purchases or buys or writes about or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very easy to rank a big mass of the, the items very low. Um, and you can see that model is overtraining a little bit. Um, and here I validate on tokens I have seen in the training set. Uh, so that's not that's a, not in the cold start problem, but if I do look at tokens not seen, but only using the features of those tokens, I get. I mean the cold start problem, where I don't know the token history from my training set. I only know the features of those items and those users, and you can see that that's a much harder problem. So my validation metrics goes down, because I don't really know, and that's the, the in the classic. Classical collaborative filtering case is that the user history is the most predictive if you have a big history. And if you don't have the history, you need to add these features. Um, but of course, you, you, you don't have that much information. I, don't, I like sci-fi books, but I only like 2% of all the sci-fi books out there. So it's not super predictive. Okay, and here I plot the curve, the recall precision curve for different case, just to see that uh, precision goes down if recall goes up. Uh, and I can also look at the AUC distribution, because when you calculate these metrics, you just take the mean over the whole data set, because I calculate it for each user. But if I look at the distribution, for example, you can see that it's, for most users, I have a really high AUC, but then for some users, it's a big tail here, that are users that have chosen really peculiar items. Maybe I'm, uh, in, this, in this scenario it would be that I have chosen to write about um, a city, Manhattan. Uh, that's not a city, but I have chosen to write an article about Manhattan. It's probably the only one in my data set that I have chosen to write about that. But I had some statistics paper there. Right, okay. I get, that's break time, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay, cool. Um, so now I can just end this first session quite uh, nicely with looking at predictions for Hinton, for example. So according to my, map, my model, I can predict what Hinton should write his next papers about. Maybe he has already written about this, I actually I don't know. But he should write about analysis, approach, Bayesian classification, and so on. I don't dare on commenting here and taking out the other ones. Uh, maybe I can do that. But, uh, can look at Jerome Friedman, for example. And it takes some time. And now I get what Jerome Friedman should write about. Sort of similar, but... And I also can look at how similar the, uh, these authors are to each other by taking the scalar products of their embedding that I have trained on. And you can see, for example, my first scalar product is between Friedman and LeCun, and it's low, and between Hinton and LeCun, it's higher. So you can see that Hinton and LeCun are in the same field, so they, have, they are more similar in terms of what they write about, but Friedman is this old stat guy, he only writes about clustering, and you know, no, it's not true, but, but so he's not that similar to the other ones. So you can see anyway it's working. Yes, uh, and now for a break, 15 minutes, and then we go to the deep stuff. Whoa.